Okay, so the graph consistently goes up over the years. Okay, so let's see if we can edit that a little bit. So first we'll write the graph consistently Is it the same? Is it consistent or almost consistent? It's not consistent because consistent implies constant, right? And is it a constant increase from year to year? No. So the graph. So what we can say, and it's not so much the graph. What are we looking at here? We're looking at the cost. Two variables, right? The cost, the average cost of tuition and fees at four-year public colleges versus time, right? The time starting with 2000, right? So let's, let's edit it a little bit. So what you could say is that the average cost of tuition and fees at four-year colleges, oops, and it's public colleges, increases each year between what? Between 2000 to 2010, right? So that's one thing we can say. We can't say that the increase is consistent or another word we use in mathematics is constant because as we move from one year to the next, the change in the tuition isn't the same. It is not a constant rate. What, when you do have a constant rate of change between your two variables, what kind of relationship do we call that when there's a constant rate of change? Yeah, Cyrus? Linear, right. So this is not a linear relationship, okay? But we can say that as one variable increases, the other one increases. But it's just not at the same constant rate. Okay, what else did you notice about about this uh, relationship here. Anything else? It's a few other things people tend to notice. Right, so 2010 certainly was the most expensive and some people actually talk about the fact that between 2000 and 2010 it, what, more than doubled, right? So that's another, um, observation that between 2000 and 2010, the uh, average cost of tuition and fees more than doubled. Yep. Okay. What else do you notice? Yep. From 2000 to 2001, so between 2000 and 2001, between 2000, there, there was uh, was the smallest increase, right? Okay. So did it go up exponentially? That's a good question. Is it an exponential increase? And um, we're, we'll be studying exponential um, functions at the end of the semester. And I would say that it's not quite exponential. It, it's not rising as quickly as if this had an exponential um, model or formula. Um, but it might be another type of uh, increase that you're familiar with. Um, because you notice that it starts off, the increase starts off slow, and then it's, it, it gradually increases, right? kind of increases kind of quickly. If it increased really quickly from one year to the next, then it would be what Olivia is saying is exponential. So maybe um, a parabola might be a good, a good fit here, some type of like curve like this, right? Or some of you might still insist that maybe a line might be a good fit for that graph can't exactly model a line because it's not a constant rate of change and you can't exactly model a, a parabola because um, it can't go through all of those points and still remain a nice smooth curve. So let's see uh, in a few minutes what we're going to use here to try to model this um, relationship. All right, 
So the next question asks you about um, this little squiggly line here that appears in the y-axis. Does anybody know what that little squiggle thing is about that appears in this little, the vertical axis right here, the tuition and free fees axis? Yeah, Lorenzo? It's not even being mentioned. And what comes before that? What are we used to seeing at that corner down here? Zero, right? So this is not starting at zero. And we call this a break in the axis. And because, um, in, in part of it is to save space, you know, because if we started this way down at zero, zero would probably be down here somewhere, right? And all of these um, rectangles would be really tall. Um, and so you have to look at what happens is a lot of time people look at what is the range of my data set here? Where, does my, where is my first value and where is my, my last value? And it goes from 3362 to 7020. So rather than starting way, way down here at zero and having nothing in here, no values, no uh, tuition and fees, we st decided to start at 3000. Now, there's some good things about this and some not so good things about this. And sometimes if you've taken a stat course, with these bar graphs that do not start at zero. Whenever you look at a newspaper or a published um, graph, if it doesn't start at zero, there should be that break there to, to make you realize it's not starting at zero. Because let me show you, if I just plotted those 11 points, what it would look like. And this is in GeoGebra, so, which you'll be working with very shortly. So hang on, where is it? Where did I put that little thing? I hope I didn't close it out. It looks like I did. Hang on. Your next class, you'll be introduced um, more formally to GeoGebra, and we'll be using GeoGebra throughout the semester. And notice, if you were to look at these 11 points and compare them to the points to the bar graph on your class notes, what might you what might you say about the difference between them? It's like zooming out, right? Like when you break, do a break, when you don't do a break in the axis, it would be like looking at the picture in front of you and zooming out. Does it look like the the change between D and points D and E here, or which you, what you're calling 2003 and 2004, is as 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 uh, drastic as it is on here? Where does it look more drastic that jump on your paper or here? The paper, right? This tends to flatten it out a little bit. It doesn't look as as exaggerated, right, as it does on your paper. So sometimes people can try to mislead a little bit by changing the axes. And there's a whole, um, you know, way you can distort the information by changing scales and not putting breaks in the ax, uh, putting breaks in the axes without indicating it. So you always got to be careful when you look at these graphs. So here are the 11 points graphed. And notice what I did over here. Um, most of you, I think, are familiar with the Excel spreadsheet. This acts very similar to Excel. The first column is just the, the last digit in the year from 2000. So in other words, 2000 is 0, 2001 is 1. So it's the number of years after 2000 up to 2010. And then column B is the actual um, to average tuition and fee for that year. And then each of those points are graphed here. Now, one of the things that GeoGebra can do for you, as you can see here, it's got, it looks like it has a line going through there right now, doesn't it? But if I zoom out, it's actually a parabola that's going through those points. So in mathematics, one of the things we try to do is we try to find an equation that what we call, this is a loose term, fits the data the best. And in this case, this parabola fits it a little teeny bit better than the straight line fits it. This 
let me make that line a little thicker so you can see it. Go down to Object Properties. I'm going to change it just so it's a little bit thicker and easy to see. And maybe I'll do the same to the parabola, just so you can see a little bit of the features of GeoGebra here. So you can see they both fit it really well. And unless I zoom in really close, you can see some of the differences between the, the parabola and the straight line. Neither one of them go through all the points. One fits a little bit better. OK, so the, the equation that we're going to be working with today uh, in our class demo is the parabola. And what I've done is I've, I've rounded it to the nearest whole number so that it's 4x squared plus 341x plus 3194. I didn't put in the um, hundredths place. So that's a little bit of GeoGebra. So let's go back now to our class notes. And again, we'll be getting more on GeoGebra on Wednesday for class. Question, might you be interested in asking about average tuition and fees when you see a, a graph like this? What types of questions might you be interested, given that you're all students in higher education right now? What type of question do you think you might be interested? Lorenzio? Yeah. Okay, so so is education so yeah of course these are these are questions you have. Is education actually getting better as the cost increases? And what was your other question? Are there external factors? Okay, that are that's affecting the increase, right? Okay. Those are that's certainly a good question, and usually every year students are interested in why is it going up or why is it increasing so much. Uh, that's often the question people have. E Evan? Yep. Why are adjuncts making starvation wages? Yep. And that's across the country. Anything else you think? But uh, this is year 2017. When do, what, would it be reasonable to say maybe 2020, 2021 might be a reasonable time frame that you'll finish a bachelor's degree for those of you transferring? Does that seem like a reasonable time frame? So what might you be interested in in terms of 2020 or 2021? Will the increase continue? Right. Right. So will to the average cost of tuition and fees increase at the same well increase according to this trend? Or specifically, what will the average cost of tuition and fees be at four-year public colleges. It's a mouthful, I know. Say in 2020. Okay. So the trend doesn't seem to to uh, indicate that it's going to go down in 2020. It's just how much will it continue to increase at what rate? And if we if we go back to that GeoGebra picture, and in a sense, you can see that the parabola is at a, actually at a slower rate than the straight line is. So um, we'll see what happens. We have to wait to 2020. All right. So that was the preview activities. And now we'll have maybe 10 minutes or so for the teaching demo, maybe 15. And then you'll have the rest of the class to work on your class activity. So you want to start us off, Cyrus, with number one? Sure. So here's a relationship between two variables right here. This is a, a graph. It 
we wouldn't have been even been able to notice some of the things that you pointed out if I just gave you a table. So the old uh, saying that a picture is worth a thousand words is is really true when you look at the graphical representation or relationship between two variables. Now what we want to try to do is somehow quantify this relationship using an equation. So um, we are using the equation that um, we saw in GeoGebra with that parabola um, that was trying to get as close to all those points as possible. Again, I don't have it written um, expressed in terms of the hundredths decimal place, I've rounded it to the nearest whole number. So when you look at a formula or an equation like this, you have to know what the variables represent or it's meaningless to you. Just like when you look at a graph, you have to know what each axis represents and what the, there should be a title on the graph. So when I look at this formula, I know what it's talking about in terms of what the variables are and then I can see the relationship as that's expressed in this equation. So it says this formula or this equation, this model, whatever word you want to use, models the average cost of tuition and fees T. So I know T is the average cost of tuition and fees. Notice I took a little shortcut here. I didn't say at four-year public colleges. Okay, For the college year ending X years after 2000. So X represents the number of years after 2000. So you can think of 2000 as your, your base year or your initial year. It's when X equals zero, because 2000 is zero years after 2000. So 2000 would be given X equals zero, 2007 would be given the X value seven, et cetera. Okay? The other little thing that I do that might be different than some, some algebra, college algebra teachers because of my statistics background is I always put a little hat uh, on this variable because this is a variable that we are estimating or predicting. Okay, It's not the actual, we won't get the actual data value out. We won't get the actual cost, uh, the average cost of tuition and fees. So I always use that little hat to remind me that this is a predicted or estimated value. Okay. So let's use this formula to find the average cost of tuition and fees at public U.S. colleges for the college year ending in 2010. Now we know the actual value. We know the actual value is 7,020. So we want to see how well our model uh, predicts that value or estimates that value. So how would I use this formula um, to find the average cost in the year 2000? Nora? Yeah, I'm going to plug in x equals 10. And how do I get that 10? I take the year I'm interested in, and I subtract 2,000 from it to give me the 10. So I now, everywhere I see x, I plug in 10. And this comes out to be 7,004. Okay, 7,004. So then I look at the next question, and it says, by how much does this formula underestimate or overestimate the actual cost shown in the bar graph? Well, it certainly underestimates it, and it underestimates it by $16. So your textbook will be asking you about whether your um, models underestimate or overestimate the actual value. So you'll either be given the actual value in a table or on a graph like we just had, and then you compare the two. So that's pretty good, okay, as an estimate. Any questions so far on A or B and how to use the model in predicting or estimating values? All right, so let's take a look at C. Use the model a formula to predict the average cost of tuition and fees for the year ending 2014 and then for the year 1990. So table one over here where Nora, Phelan, and Jim and Isaac are sitting and table two and then um, I guess Evan, so those two tables and Evan, Evan will do this one. So tables 
one and two in Evan. And then the rest of you will do 1990. And I want everybody to confer to make sure you all agree before you tell me what the cost is for each of those years. So work on it, confer with each other, and then uh, one representative will tell me the, what you got, what you arrived at for your answer. Okay? In this first one, the college year ending 214, what did you use for the value of X, table one and two? 14. And for 1990, what did you use for the value of X? Negative 10, right, because it's in the past. Okay. So um, before we move on to question four, one of your, um, the first project, which even though it says on the, on the schedule, I'll hand it out Wednesday, I'm going to hand it out today, because I know there's some eager beavers in here that want to get going really quickly. Um, I ask you questions and similar to this that you have to answer. And one of the things you'll notice is on the very back page of this project is a rubric, a grading rubric. And one of the things you'll see in the grading rubric is a, a statement like this that I check off is that you've done it or you haven't done it. The y-intercept is not stated as an estimated value based on the model. And what I mean by that is if you were to answer this question right here, predict the average cost of tuition and fees at public U.S. colleges for the year ending in 1990, if you were to answer that with a full sentence, you have to state in there somewhere that $184 is an estimated or predicted value. It is not the actual value. So your sentence must contain those words. So let's just practice it for a, a minute. So in 1990, the estimated or predicted, whatever you want to use, estimated or predicted average cost of tuition and fees at four-year colleges is $184. So notice you have the year, you have the value of one variable, and you have the value of your other variable, including units. And you have the most important word for this right now, at least beside the actual value, you also have that it's a predicted or estimated in your sentence. So you want to make sure you make a little note right now to yourself that when you're writing up your project that you make sure you do that for answering your questions because it's not the actual value. So what do you think about $184 for 1990? Does that seem reasonable or plausible? It sounds good, but do you think in 1990 the average cost of tuition at four-year schools was $184? No. Okay, and this is where you can get into trouble when you look at models. So if we zoom out here and look at these models, you see that shortly the line is actually predicting zero the cost of zero for tuition, average tuition and fees even before 1990. It's, it looks like about 1997 so, right? Uh, let's see, seven years, yeah, 1993. And the parabola is predicting zero shortly after 19, shortly before 1990. Right, yeah, and then after that, you're getting paid to go to school, right? So. There is, if you go too far outside of your data range, our, our, range, um, our range right now goes from 2000, our years go from 2000 to 2010. Later on, we're going to be calling that the domain. We don't have that fancy word now. But anytime you go too far outside of your data, you could get into trouble, okay? Uh, because your model breaks down. It's really a good fit. This green parabola is really a good fit for those 11 points. But when we get too far outside of that, we could get into trouble with our predictions and estimates. So this is what we call a model breakdown. Okay, And you'll see that written right here. Come on. Right there. That if it seems that your answer is unreasonable given the context of your story you want to say this is an example of model breakdown you can actually use that terminology and say that something else is happening 
that we couldn't have seen back in 2010, all right? For example, think about the average cost of um, gasoline, right? It was going up, up, up. It was $3.99 a gallon. And now this summer, it was like $1.99. So if we had used a model, even a linear uh, relationship, we would have kept predicting that for 2006, the summer of 16, it would have been probably up to like closer to $5 a gallon. We would have been way off. So you've always got to be keep an eye to uh, any time you're using a model to go outside the data. All right, I'm going to give you two fancy words for this. Uh, when you go outside your data set, like 1990 or 2020, that's called extrapolating. Extrapolating is when you are estimating a value that's outside your data. 2014 and 1990 would be examples of extrapolation. The very first problem we did here with 2010 2010 is within our data range, which was part of our model. This is called interpolation. Okay. Yep. Interpolation is when you are estimating a value with a model that's within your data range. And extrapolation is when you're estimating when you're on either end of your data range, either in this case the past or the future. Okay. I guess be here now is an important st statement even in modeling. All right, so those are just kind of fancy words. So um, 2014, the estimate was 87.52. I have a little note here that um, at four-year institutions, that number was 40,917. Um, and it's up 14% over the previous five years. The average price at four-year colleges at that time was 18,000. So uh, tuition rates and fee rates have gone up, um, especially at private colleges, about 6% every year. So we could talk about that as an exponential growth later on, 6% every year. OK, but that will be like mm, end of April, we'll talk about that. All right, we just got to talk about sets a little bit, uh, not the word you thought I said, S-E-T-S, sets, a little less exciting. Uh, and then you'll be all set for your class activities. Oh, I got a few smiles. That's good. So, uh, Russell, want to start us off with number five? Set is just a collection of objects. For six. Elements of a set are the individual numbers or, in, or names, whatever your, your set is depicting. They're separated by a comma, but important, un, underlined in red, is that any time you write a set in this class, you must put curly braces, these little curly cues right here. That indicates a set. If you put parentheses, it's not a set. Parentheses are used for other things in mathematics, like ordered pairs of points. And you'll see in a minute another notation that uses parentheses. So those curly braces must be present whenever you represent a set. The roster method means you, like the class roster right here. Here's the class roster. Each one of you are listed individually on this class roster. And that's what the roster method of a set does. So for example, if I wanted to say A, the big capital letter A represented the set of the three stooges, I would say A equals, I'd use my little curly cues, and then I would represent each of those three stooges by their name, Larry, comma, Mo, comma, curly, and then the curly brace to end. Okay, so this is an example of the roster method for indicating a set. All right, so let's move on. Let's suppose I wanted to let B represent the set of the four beetles, I'm going to give you a chance to do this at your seats, the set of four beetles that arrived at JFK International Airport in 1964. So see if you can come up with the four beetles. Let's see what we can come up with. So how did, what, what's the first thing you have after the equal sign? Uh, thank goodness, the curly bra brace here, right. Okay, who wants to give it a shot? Yeah? Joe? Mm, John. Does anybody know John's last name? 
Lennon, Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr, and George Harrison, right? All right. So those are the four Beatles that arrived in 1964. Um, and again, here was a little reminder that I asked you if you remembered when you wrote these names down, did you remember to use the curly braces? If not, make sure they're there and make a little, put a little star to remind yourself so that you don't forget in the future. Okay. So typically the sets that we encounter in this class are based on sets of numbers. And we can't possibly use the Rasta method when we're talking about sets of numbers because they're generally they're infinite sets, right? we talk about sets of numbers. So we have three ways to depict sets of numbers, and we're going to look at all three of them in the next couple of minutes. The first one, set builder notation, is sort of um, a descriptive way to write a set, and it always has this form. It always starts with the curly braces, and then your variable. Then you have this straight vertical line, and then you have x meeting some condition here. So it's either a statement, an inequality, or a quality, something that you can actually look at and say, does this number meet that criteria or not? And if it is, it's in my set, and if it isn't, it's not in my set. So if I were to read this little statement right here that's in set builder notation, this would say the set of all x such that, that's how we read that vertical line, such that x is greater than 2. That's what it means. Every single number greater than 2. Okay, and that's a set. Another way to represent that same set of numbers with a number line would be like this. Now notice I have this parenthesis here. This is sort of something your book does. In general, when you were probably taking other math classes, you would see what we call an open circle at two. I think that's probably more familiar to you. Um, and this says, I'm not including two, but every single real number after two, all the way up to out to positive infinity is part of this set, all right? That little parenthesis that you see there, again, is, is what your book uses because of the next notation called interval notation. To represent this set with interval notation, you always start with your smaller number, which in this case, the smaller number, if it was included, would be 2. Because I'm not including 2, notice I'm using a parenthesis. That says 2 is not part of this set. And the second number isn't a number, it's an idea called in positive infinity. And again, that has, well, positive infinity and negative infinity will always have a parenthesis because it's not a number that can be included. So these are the three ways that you can describe the set of numbers greater than two. Set builder, real number line, or interval notation. If I wanted to include two, I would use this bracket. And that bracket indicates that the endpoint is included in the set. So if it said greater than or equal to 2, if my inequality up here was greater than or equal to 2, then I would use this bracket. All right. So let's take a look at um, these two sets here and see if we can come up with the interval notation. And again, where you see a bracket, you would have seen a solid dot in the past. So I'm going to use both of those so that you can, uh, so it will help you to understand. Okay, so what could I do for interval notation for this first number line representation? What set is indicated there, Jesse? Uh, yeah. Four. Four, right. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, and what about the second one? Any ideas for that one? Okay, yeah. Parentheses, right? Anytime, again, we use infinity, positive or negative infinity, we use parentheses with that, right? One bracket, because one's included. Okay. You'll have a lot of practice with interval notation throughout the class. And most often, it's more efficient to use in the 
set builder, but there will be times when set builder is actually easier to use in interval notation. So you'll have practice throughout the next 14 weeks, um, and this will become second nature to you. Okay, so you have about a 20 minutes to work on your class activities. I think that will give you time to finish them up. Let me know if you have any questions.